Good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Lindsay. I am the director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law here at the University of Texas at Austin. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here tonight to a talk by Professor Philip Bobbitt. Uh, Philip, it is safe to say, is well known to many of you here. He is a distinguished senior lecturer at the University of Texas School of Law. Uh, he is also the Herbert Wexler Professor of Jurisprudence at the Columbia University Law School, as well as a senior fellow uh, at the Robert S. Strauss Center. I think it is safe to say that Philip is one of the nation's leading constitutional scholars, uh, but his gifts do not end talking about the intricacies of the U.S. Constitution and constitutional construction, uh, but also extend to the topic we have here tonight, uh, which is international security in the history of strategy. <laughs> Uh, Philip is the author of what can only be described as the magisterial, uh, The Shield of Achilles, War, Peace, in the Course of History, uh, which one reviewer hailed as, and I quote, breathtaking in its scope, a book that is, quote, massive, erudite, and demanding. Uh, tonight, Philip is going to give a talk based on his most recent book, Terror and Consent. Uh, it has been uh, issued to rave reviews. Uh, just to quote one of them, the famed British historian Neil Ferguson uh, called Terror and Consent, let me get it accurate here, quote, the most profound book to have been written on the subject of American foreign policy since the attacks of 9-11, indeed since the end of the Cold War. Uh, quite, quite high praise for a book that well deserves it. It may even exceed uh, Neil, Ferguson's, Neil Ferguson's kind words. Uh, I'm delighted to tell all of you that the book is available uh, for purchase over at, I believe it's called Co-op East, and they may even stay open a little bit late tonight if you want to rush out and get a copy. I'd ask that uh, Philip finish his remarks uh, before you make a beeline uh, to the bookstore. Two sort of uh, housekeeping details. First off, if you have a BlackBerry cell phone or a watch that goes beep, anything that will begin to make noise, uh, play Tchaikovsky, Eminem, Snoop Dogg, what have you, uh, that you mute it uh, or turn it off would be greatly appreciated. Uh, the second thing is I have to actually dash off uh, to take care of a child care emergency. It's not a comment on Philip, uh, so I apologize. Uh, Cindy Levinson has at the last moment agreed to uh, stay in and uh, serve as moderator. Uh, with that housekeeping, uh, de those housekeeping details out of the way, uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our own Philip Bobbitt. I want to... Um begin by reading, I think, just six lines of a famous poem by Marianne Moore that will, I hope, set the, the theme for my topic tonight. It's from a poem I think you probably may know. It's excerpted in A, a Terran Consent called, What Are Years? What is our innocence? What is our guilt? All are naked. None is safe. And whence is courage? The unanswered question, the resolute doubt, dumbly calling, deftly listening, that in misfortune, even death, encourages others, and in its defeat, stirs the soul to be strong. The relationship between ideas uh, like the ones in that poem and the ones in uh, this lecture tonight, the ones in the kinds of books that uh, Professor Levinson and I write, and action is very hard to trace. It's very flattering when uh, one hears that uh, one's ideas have been put into action by some uh, official, but I think usually exaggerated. Uh, the ideas of intellectuals rather than motivating people to action, are usually picked up when they're handy and put aside when they no longer fit the preconceptions of the person using them. It's very hard to find ideas that get us to reset our notions, that try and uh, shape the way our preconceptions are felt rather than fit with them. Since 1990, the end of the long war of the 20th century, three ideas have dominated political discourse about international security. The first of these is associated with the 
name of Frank Fukuyama. Uh, and I think everyone here uh, knows the phrase he has made famous, the end of history. Now, of course, uh, Fukuyama did not mean, as some of his critics quite unfairly charged, that history itself would end. What he meant was that a particular epoch in history, in the dynamic dialectic of history, had come to a stable point. That at least among the great powers, there was a consensus that free markets, free institutions, and international institutions governed by law would dominate the legitimate forms of the state for the foreseeable future. The phrase wasn't a Fukuyama's, as he acknowledged, it was Hegel's. Because Hegel had felt very much the same at, after the Battle of Jena, when another constitutional order, the imperial state, had been uh, foisted off on the unwilling Europeans and then passionately adopted by them after the fall of Napoleon. Fukuyama was writing about an unusual period, a period following a long and ardent struggle. And his ideas permeated the administration of George H.W. Bush, of which uh, he was a member. Those ideas, however, uh, ran aground in the Balkans and the struggle in Bosnia. A second idea that I think intellectual historians will identify with this period is the virtuous cycle of globalization. And this is often associated with, among many others, the journalist Tom Friedman. You all know the idea. It is that uh, freer institutions lead to freer markets. Freer markets lead to an increase in global trade. An increase in global trade yields a higher increase in the product of productive societies, which in turn uh, free the role of women to enter the workplace, which in turn creates an even more prosperous society, which in turn seeks even freer markets, which makes for even greater global prosperity and so on. And this idea dominated the administrations of Bill Clinton. It, too, uh, ran aground at the Pentagon and uh, at Ground Zero on 9-11, where we saw the dark face of globalization. A third idea that I think people will look back on as having been pivotal in this period is associated with Sam Huntington, the political science professor who just uh, died this year. First in an article and then in a book of the same name, he said we would face a clash of civilizations rather than a clash of ideologies in the 21st century. Not uh, left and right, not first and second and third worlds, but six great cultures, you call them civilizational, would, where they abraded each other, cause conflict. Hindu, South Asian, Han, Chinese, Western European and American, and so on. And this seemed to capture something about Bosnia that had bedeviled Fukuyama's thesis, because in Yugoslavia, three plates, as it were, like tectonic plates, erupted against each other. From the West, the post-Renaissance Roman Catholic plate. From the East, the Slavic Orthodox plate. From the South, the Muslim plate from the Near East and the Maghreb. And where they met each other, just as great plates cause eruptions and earthquakes, along that fault line was fought the horrible wars of the Balkans, not just in the early 20th century, but most recently in the 1990s. It also seemed to explain something about 9-11, because here, too, you saw a civilizational clash, a clash between the modern West and what appeared to so many way to be a pre-modern version of Islam. And this idea, a clash of civilizations, dominated the administration of George W. Bush. But it, too, uh, ran aground in the sands of Mesopotamia, where the struggle was not between East and West, between the Christian Europe and the Islamic Near East, but between Shia and Sunni. And it continues to run aground in Afghanistan, where the struggle is not between occupying Americans and defensive uh, Islamic insurgents, 
but between Taliban and between Afghan warlords, between India and Pakistan, states that came within the same single civilization that uh, Huntington had identified. So where are we now? We have a new administration. We don't know yet what uh, idea will, in retrospect, be seen to have been brought to the fore by people groping for tools to put into place the goals that they want uh, and even now perhaps only can dimly see. But we know this. We know that five developments, you could probably give me another 50, are undermining the nature of the state, a question that Fukuyama and Huntington and Friedman did not address. In no particular order, I would say these five are the creation of an international program of human rights that supersedes the power of any single 20th century or 21st century nation state to enforce its own laws. Milosevic was in the dock not because he had violated Serbian law, indeed he was a democratically elected leader, but because he had violated international human rights norms. Second, the creation of a global system of trade and finance. I need to hardly remind anyone in this room that we are now, having been for so many years the beneficiary of such a system, now one of its uh, many victims. It is a system in which no state can control the value of its own currency. Uh, just to give a single example, the Japanese yen now has soared, not because the Japanese economy has soared, indeed quite the opposite, but because of the carry trade in Europe. Third are transnational threats, AIDS, SARS, climate change, terrorism itself, that no state can hide from, that no matter what its defensive perimeter, whether it's Burma or North Korea, no state can keep itself at bay from these threats that vault over national and state lines. Then we have a global system of culture and communications. And by communications, I include transport. So that no state, no matter how powerful, can insulate its people from the effects of a global culture, nor hold at arm's length those persons who travel globally every day. It means that in a state like our own, our health system is only as strong as the weakest health system in the poorest country in the world, because a single person traveling in such a country, perhaps by bus, along with maybe one of you taking a gap year uh, and going on to an airport and landing uh, 10 hours later in JFK, can spread a virus or pathogen that in the past would have burned out in some remote part of the earth. The same thing is true with electronic communications. While it's true that we have created this system, it is a system that has empowered our own vulnerabilities and their exploitation. Finally, I would just mention the development of weapons of mass destruction. We have more than a million and a half men and women under arms. We could have 10 million, and it would not make us safer against the detonation of either a nuclear weapon or a biological pathogen in an attack. But nation states are not the only form of the state. If you had the uh, misfortune as undergraduates to have been a political science student, you might have been told that the nation state arose in the middle of the 17th century. At 1648, uh, one is often uh, informed, at the Treaty of Westphalia that terminated the Thirty Years' War. And so we are told by political scientists, this is the form within which we live now. They are not lawyers, and they are not constitutional lawyers, or they would not be so naive. There was a state system, although an early modern one, already in place at the time of Westphalia. And its most famous phrase, uh, he whose religion uh, is he who rules, uh, that was a phrase not from Westphalia, where it never appears, but from the Treaty of Augsburg in the preceding century. The state that Westphalia gave us is not the only state Europe has had. Indeed, it is not the only state the world has had. And when the form of the state within which we have lived since the 
First World War decays, the state itself will not pass away, but as in the past, will morph or be transformed into a different form of the state. To see if I can persuade you of this, let me take you back to the birth of the modern state. Go with me outside the high stone curtain walls of Constantinople. It's 15, I'm oh, sorry, it's 1453. Uh, Mehmet II has been besieging this city for years. Within these high walls, these impregnable fortress walls, lies the residue of classical culture. The last uh, copies of uh, poems and, and plays by the great classic authors of Rome and Greece. The manuscripts recording the theater of Sophocles and the philosophy of Plato. But Mehmet has a uh, something undreamt of by Plato or Sophocles. His engineers have constructed a 27-foot tube, a hollow bronze tube, within which they have packed explosives and round, curved stone spheres. And as they begin to batter these high walls down for the first time since their construction, they begin to crumble, slowly but inexorably, so that the persons within those walls eventually lose heart and flee and Mimic conquers the city. Where do they go? They go to Italy, and they inseminate the Renaissance thereby. And if you've ever wondered how it is that classical ideas, ideas unknown in Europe for centuries, suddenly appear in Italy, this is why. If you've asked yourself, why is it that the birth of the modern state is coincident with the appearance, or I should say reappearance, of perspective in drawing, the nude in painting, a melody in music. You know, the, all of you probably know the pre-Renaissance non-melodic chants. Uh, <laughs> right? Doesn't sound like a Gershwin or uh, Elvis Presley, does it? But the uh, ancients had a more melodic tune a line that was reintroduced into music uh, in, the in the 15th century. Mehmet's canon was too heavy. It was too stationary for anything but a very long siege. But in 1494, when Charles VIII came into the Italian plain, he brought mobile cannon. Cannon had been in Europe for a long time. What they lacked was the power of Mehmet's charges and the new mobility of Charles's light bronze cannon. They were cast with the technology used, ironically, to cast church bells. The Italians immediately recognized the change. The rich, weak, walled cities of Italy, the five cities that contended for supremacy there, knew their politics were at an end. That henceforth, they would be the playthings of Spain and France and the empire. Machiavelli noticed this. Uh, so did Guicciardini. What the cities needed was a state. That is, they needed something that would survive the leadership of the occasional prince. Feudalism had a series of legal institutions that were born and died with the person of the prince. Treaties, for example, ceased to exist if a signatory died. Legations and embassies were personal representatives. All this had to change. Princes now needed something that would outlast them so that their treaties could outlast them. They needed a more solid bureaucratic foundation to raise money, money for fortresses. The high walls within which they sheltered had to be torn down and lower walls built further out from the city so they could put their own artillery on top of those walls to keep besiegers at bay. They needed permanent embassies. And so from this period date the first permanent legations also the first permanent foreign intelligence cadres. They needed better tax collection. They needed better logistical preparation. They needed a state. And so the first modern states begin to appear uh, at this time. Now, it, as I've told you the story so far, it looks as though a fundamental change in strategy and warfare brings about a fundamental change in the constitutional order. 
and has given birth to the modern state. And that's true. But it's a half-truth. It really depends where in the stream of time the historian chooses arbitrarily to step in. So, for example, at the time of the French Revolution, the territorial army of France lost its ability to wage the wars of that kind of army, intensely professional, billeted away from cities, uh, trained in hardy shock tactics of fire and tremendous coherence and concision. These were no longer possible because the leadership that made that possible had been driven out of France. In its place, French generals had armies of millions, but they were millions of proletarians and peasants. They never held a weapon, never discharged a volley, never worn a uniform, never been on a march. And if they were shot at, they threw their weapons down and they fled. With this raw material brought about not by a change in strategy, but by a change in the constitutional order, the French Revolution, Napoleon and his colleagues fashioned a new form of warfare. Instead of the line advancing towards a firing square, Napoleon turns his troops into a file so they don't see exactly where they're going. The mass carnage of the 19th century begins here with battles 10 times the size of those fought in the early part of the previous century. So in that case, it's a change in the constitutional order that brings about a change in warfare. I believe <clears throat> we are about to undergo a similar change, that a change in the nature of warfare will accelerate a change in the constitutional order, and a change in the constitutional order, even as it's just beginning, will bring about a change in the nature of warfare. Sometimes um, my uh, essays are accused of being a monocausal, as though I were a military historian saying that military events drive changes in our constitutional order. Uh, this is not true. None of my students would make this mistake. We exist instead in a kind of mutually excited circuit. And warfare drives changes in the state, but changes in the state drive changes in warfare. And we are in the midst of just such a profound change now. That's why I'll argue in the next few minutes, it is not a misnomer to say that we are fighting a war against terror. Because a war against terror would not have made sense in a previous constitutional order and cannot be avoided in the one we are entering. Now I see some skeptical faces. I think you think uh, that a war on terror is a metaphor, like a war against poverty or war on crime. Last year, one of my students sent me a copy of The Onion that had the headline, Flash from War on Drugs. Drugs win. <laughs> and so you probably think that a war on terrorists is absurd enough, but a war on terror is simply nonsense. How could you have a war against an emotion? Will we have wars against nostalgia? Are we going to have wars against pity or euphoria? It's, it's, it's absurd. Who would sign the peace treaty? We believe, I think, that a war against terror is nonsense, in part because we have not seen the kind of devastation that we expect to see in warfare. This is a passage from El País, an essay written by the editor there, a very brilliant man, and he says, Here in Spain, we don't feel as if we're at war because we aren't, and neither are the inhabitants of the United States, however vociferously many Americans may insist that they are. War is something else entirely. No normal life can be led while war is going on. The Madrellanos, who lived through the siege of their city from 1936 to 1939, know that very well. The survivors of the daily bombardments of London during the Second World War know it too. And those Americans who participated in that war, they know it also. There is no war against terrorism. There can be no such thing against an enemy that remains dormant most of the time and is rarely visible, it's simply another of life's inevitable troubles. But all we can do as we continue to combat it is to repeat Cervantes' famous phrase, paciencia y barja, 
Have patience and keep shuffling the cards. And there are other characteristics besides the lack of mass destruction that make a war against terror seem ill-suited to our ideas of what really constitutes warfare. This is a passage written by a friend of mine, Simon Jenkins, in the Times Literary Supplement. Simon says, there's no war on terror. There's no enemy army. There can be no negotiations, no treaty, and no peace. Terrorism is simply a nuisance, a technique of conflict as old as war itself. And it's true that at present, the most notable fact about the years that have followed 9-11 is just how little violence and death have ensued. Despite the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, there were fewer deaths in warfare during these years than at any time during the wars of the 20th century. Just to give you a benchmark, during World War II, on average, 16,000 people died every single day of the conflict. Despite a murderous campaign against Americans that began well before 9-11, the number of Americans killed by international terrorists since the late 60s is about the same as the number who died during that period from allergies to peanuts. In fact, despite terrorist attacks on many cities besides New York, London, Madrid, Casablanca, Istanbul, and many other cities, since 9-11, the total number of persons worldwide who've been killed by terrorists is about the same number who drowned in bathtubs in the U.S. You could conclude that it would be a little short of neurotic to think of a struggle against terror as a kind of war. Finally, the character of terrorism seems to many more appropriate to treatment as crime than as warfare. One hears this a lot from Europeans who have been so successful at treating terrorism on that continent with law enforcement rather than with defense officials. They say, we know terror and you don't. And your reaction is typical of societies that overreact or react in panic to unfamiliar threats. What I want to do is to look at all three elements of this argument. Whether or not war is an appropriate term, whether or not terrorism can be the subject of war, and how you could possibly win a war against terror, there being no state you could invade, no leader who could sign a peace agreement. So let's look at these ideas. First, let's look at, at uh, terrorism. I said a few minutes ago that Europeans often say they know terror in a way that we don't. And of course, this is true. But what is the terror that they know? They know 20th century nation state terror. They know the PKK. My friends in Britain know the IRA. The French know the FLN. The uh, Israelis know the PLO and Hamas. The Spanish know uh, ETA. That is, they know nationalist struggles for liberation. But this was not always the pattern of terrorism. Think back again to the 16th century. For example, Think of the sack of Rome in 1527. It lasted for four months. The Pope was held captive in Castel Tarangelo by a mercenary army of Protestants. The city of Rome shrunk to a tiny fraction of its size, and terror simply ruled the streets, the plains, for months on end. This was copied again in 1576, the sack of Antwerp. Antwerp was the leading financial center of Europe at the time. It never recovered. This time, they were Catholic mercenaries. They thought the city of Antwerp was a libertine center. There were too many Protestants. There were too many Jews. And so a campaign of murder and rape, of extortion and torture was carried on for months at a time. It isn't just 16th century terror that was different from the national struggle of the 20th century. So it was 17th century terror, the pirates of the Caribbean that we sometimes think of as a, a rather romantic phase of history's life. In fact, more than 600 cities were sacked by pirates during this period, and many hundreds of ships taken over. The pirates themselves saw themselves as tiny sovereigns, because they reflected the constitutional order of the state against which they struggled. If in the 16th century, terrorists were 
mercenary and intensely sectarian. That's because the states that gave them birth were also mercenary and intensely sectarian. If pirate captains thought of themselves as sovereigns, setting up their own little courts, having written constitutions, declaring themselves to be sovereign, it's because the princes and kings of Europe thought of themselves in this way, because the state had changed. In the 18th century, a colonial territorial states used, on this continent, Native American savages to conduct terrible massacres against colonists. Both the French and the English employed the Iroquois and the Algonquin, respectively. The Barbary pirates of that century also were terrorists. They weren't nationalistic terrorists like the FLN, the same part of the Maghreb, but they were terrorists. Make no mistake about it. And they resembled the territorial states with whom they bargained. I wonder how many constitutional lawyers know the second largest item in John Adams' budget were payments to the Barbary pirates. We don't even think of the anarchists of the 19th century, not so far away. Anarchists that killed a Russian czar, they killed an American president, they killed a Spanish king, they killed a French president, they killed an Italian king. In fact, as you all know, they played some role in starting World War I when they killed the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. At the time of the Spanish Civil War, they were the largest party in Spain. But what happened to them? Where are they now? So my students have an anarchist streak, but I don't think of the anarchist party as very formidable. Why not? It's because they vanished when the state that gave them birth, the imperial 19th century state, vanished. And in their place came communist and fascist who then to, went on to dominate the civil war in Spain. The communists and the fascists were creatures of the 20th century nation state. They all held one fundamental claim as legitimate to that order of the state. Give us power, they said, and we will improve your material well-being. Lenin said that, Adolf Hitler said that, but so did Woodrow Wilson, and so did Franklin Roosevelt. Terrorism tracks the constitutional order. And if we are on the brink of having a new state, a new form of the state, one of the signs will be we will see a new form of terrorism. If this new form of the state is global and networked, if it outsources and privatizes its activities, we will see a terrorism that is global, that is networked, that outsources and privatizes its operations. Now, let's look at warfare. Terrorism has never had the power of the state, and yet it is becoming now more warlike. For five centuries, it has taken a state to pose a lethal threat against any other state. For five centuries, every state knew its only truly lethal opponents would come from other states. Only states could keep armies in the field, sometimes for decades, could master complex logistics, could develop new and more lethal military technologies, could conduct alliance warfare and create uh, diplomatic relations. Soon this will no longer be true. Soon relatively small numbers of persons armed with relatively small revenue streams will be able to inflict really terrible blows against societies and their states. At the same time that terrorism is becoming more warlike, warfare is becoming more like terror. Many of you probably remember when uh, General Franks announced the end of major combat operations in Iraq. At that time, 146 members of the coalition had died. More than 4,000 have died since then. Was General Franks misleading us? Was he lying? No, I don't believe that. But it is not a realistic idea about the warfare that we now face in Iraq and Afghanistan and will face again, in which I'm very pleased to say I think the Pentagon and the Secretary of Defense are well aware. The last point I want to make is to look at victory. Even if you're prepared to say that terrorism is changing and that warfare is changing, surely I can't persuade you that you can have a victory against terror. That must be the, the craziest of all the ideas of, around a war on terror. Well, what does victory look like? On Armistice Day, at the end of World War I, a young woman, uh, no one ever found out her name, 
climbed to the top of the Liberty Platform in New York City. This was a, a platform that had been erected for speeches about Liberty bonds. There were crowds below, boisterous, full of joy at the end of the terrible war, and she began to sing. She sang the doxology. And the entire city square went silent. That's what we think about victory. Uh, pretty girls kiss, sailors' caps tossed in the air, and moments of, of tremendous uh, solemnity and regret. And similar scenes were enacted at the end of World War II. On VE Day, Churchill's car, going from number 10 Downing Street, just a few blocks down to Parliament, was so crushed by the crowds that their pressure lifted the automobile off its wheels. And it was borne simply by their mass enthusiasm down to Parliament Square. Similar scenes were enacted in Waterloo. And so we think of this as the watermark of victory. But this is not so. Most people I know think that victory is the defeat of the enemy. Many military persons think that victory is the defeat of the enemy. But that's not warfare. That is football or chess. In warfare, victory is the achievement of the war aim. And that is a very different matter. You can kill a great many of the enemy. Indeed, you can hang the enemy leader. You can run your flag up the enemy's flagpole. You can occupy his palaces and subdue his army and still not achieve your war aim, as we know. If the war aim for the kind of state we're becoming is the protection of civilians, as I believe it will be, then that will be the index for victory. You are losing if you cannot protect your civilians. You are winning or you have won when you have put into place measures that successfully protect them. At the beginning of Terror and Consent, I list a number of ideas that I think are widely and uh, generally held about a war on terror. And I say that I think every single one of these is wrong. I, I won't list them for you now because I'd rather go to questions. But perhaps in the questions, you might take uh, an idea that you believe to be so obviously true that it can't be denied, that terror is a matter of Terrorism is a matter of a technique, that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, that terrorism won't flourish in democracies, or that good intelligence provides the key to successful defenses against terrorism. I suspect you may think that an increase in the power of the state means a decrease in our personal and individual liberties and rights. These are all ideas generally held and held by people I respect and, uh, and who are my colleagues. But I think every one of them is wrong. And I fear for them because unlike so many ideas held by myself and by my colleagues, these can actually disable us and work great danger for us. I began by talking about the role of ideas. And I said that the ideas of intellectuals and academics are usually exaggerated in their effect on policy. But if there is ever a time when government needs ideas, whole reworkings of the ideas that we have held pretty generally in the past, across party lines, across decades, and across the struggles of the 20th century, surely it is now. One cannot say precisely how long we have, but I believe we must urgently begin a fundamental rethinking. We have a few minutes left for questions, but I want to give you uh, one more thing. You've been kind enough to, to give me your time here. Think of the number of people in this room, why the man hours you have just given me is uh, extremely generous. So I have something to give to you. These are three stanzas from a poem by Chesel Miwash. It's called, quite appropriately, poem for the end of the century, and it was written at the end of the last century, the 20th century. It begins with a reference to the ideas, not specifically of Fukuyama, but associated with the end of history. And then it moves through the ideas about virtual globalization and about a clash of civilizations. 
he doesn't say so explicitly, but you'll hear the, the echoes as I read it. When everything was fine, and the notion of sin had vanished, and the earth was ready in universal peace to consume and rejoice without creeds and utopias, I, for unknown reasons, surrounded by the books of prophets and theologians, of philosophers, poets, searched for an answer, scowling, grimacing, waking up at night, muttering at dawn. What oppressed me so much was a bit shameful. Talking of it aloud would show neither tact nor prudence. It might even seem an outrage against the health of mankind. Thank you for coming, and I think we have probably 15 minutes for questions, would you say? Yes, I mean the nation state. No, I think the market states thrive on global systems of human rights. You know, actually, I'm quite agnostic about that. I think if Mehmet had not succeeded in destroying Constantinople, we might very well have seen a flourishing classical culture there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I'm quite agnostic about this. Well, a global system of communications allows me to spend half the year in London writing and have my secretary here in Austin. But it also allows uh, people in uh, London to uh, disguise their communications and send instructions for building uh, bombs to our enemies in Iraq. Yes, I think the implication of that is just the opposite, that a global system of human rights will have to depend upon other institutions than individual states. What would be those institutions? Well, I suppose some are coming up already. You have the Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. You have the uh, Court of uh, Human Rights in Brussels. You have individual tribunals in The Hague. You have the International Criminal Court. These are all... Uh, uh, regional and global institutions that span nation states. And you think those shall survive? Because you mentioned the I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. That, it, it's a very, it's a very uh, fine line, and it requires judgment. But the place you can't begin is to assume there are only these two options. Either we are under threat for this terrible threat, and we must scrap our institutions, or it's all exaggerated, and the only threat we have to face is the threat that we pose ourselves by overreacting. I don't think those are the two options. In fact, I think those are paralyzing uh, options. What I think is much more likely is that we do not today face a lethal threat to our cities and our society. But that is no assurance that we will never face such a threat, even in the not so distant future. And that to protect against our truly overreacting, not in anticipation of an attack, but in the aftermath of an attack, we should plan right now, talk publicly, discuss in our political campaigns, in our colleges and universities, in Congress, about what we can put into place in case such an attack occurs. That seems to me wisest, because neither of us has a crystal ball to know whether these things will eventuate or not. What do you think? That doesn't, I don't think that's inconsistent. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether there'll be a higher order priority or not, but I don't think a great power can say, I can only do one thing at a time. I can only plan for one kind of future or address one kind of threat. Yes, ma'am. No, it's not, that's not what the ideas I, I was considering. Uh, and I don't know why rehabilitation can't work. It doesn't have to work in every case. We have uh, parolees who become recidivist, but we still have a parole system. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I suppose I would say that the right of self-defense antedates the modern state itself. It doesn't just antedate Westphalia. The, the rights of self-defense we would find in the feudal era, you find even in the classical era. Our ideas about self-defense are expressed by St. Augustine, for, for that matter. So I, I think you're riding uh, that horse uh, <clears throat> a little too heavily. I mean... Uh, even if I believe that Westphalia did, as you say, enshrine the right of self-defense for the first time, which I actually do not believe, I would not say that if it did, the kind of state that it created is therefore the kind of state we have today because they share the right of self-defense. That, that seems like a logical um, leap. What do you think? Well, I suppose what I believe is that uh, in the Treaty of Westphalia, it's not just an issue of uh, individualized self-defense, but first time ever there was a ratification of a territory's right to self-defense. Um, so I suppose in that sense, if one of the fundamental characteristics of the state is that it's able to carry out warfare legitimately, then the first treaty to ever recognize the legitimate right to wield violence by a territory would be the Treaty of Westphalia. No, I see that, but I just don't see that therefore we must have the same constitutional order as those signatories. I mean, the the first kilts were run by Scotsmen in the, I don't know, 1400s. That doesn't make every woman in a skirt a Scot. 
I just made that up about it. <laughs> Let's see, we've got time for a couple more questions. Yes, sir. 2009, in our present world, does the United Nations help or hurt our effort to fight, uh, to fight terrorism? I think both. I think both. Uh, when terrorists attack us, we, we can summon up enormous reserves of patriotism. Uh, and, uh, and this happened after 9-11. And that would not be possible without deep national feeling. But remember that we had nationalism long before we had nation states. And we will have nationalism even when the nation state has been superseded. And it can also hurt us. If we become uh, rather too narrow-minded and try and treat terrorism as if it still were a national problem, we'll end up frog-marching our allies to the, uh, uh, to the uh, precipice Police and intelligence people in Germany were well aware of the Al-Qaeda cell in Hamburg where 9-11 was planned, but they didn't think it posed any problem for Germany. Yes, sir. Do you think a record set during the steroids era of baseball should be invalidated? <laughs> you know, I really haven't given that that much thought. <laughs> The question was whether or not a record set by a baseball player who was uh, on steroids at the time the record was achieved should be invalidated or should have an asterisk or uh, something of that kind. I just, I just don't know. I know a really corny joke about this, though. Uh, and given the, the sort of uh, dark message of the lecture, I think it's the least I can do to tell you. A man and his dog go into a bar. man sits down at the, at the bar on a swivel stool, and his dog hops up next to him. The bartender comes over, and he says, uh, we don't serve animals in this bar. And the uh, man says, uh, this is no ordinary dog. Uh, this dog uh, speaks English. And the bartender says, oh, really? And the man says, yes, yes, he does. And so he turns, he turns the dog around towards the dog, so he, eager. And the man says, <clears throat> what sort of structure is on top of a typical house? And the dog says, roof, roof. <laughs> and he turns back and looks very expectantly at the man behind the bar. And the bartender says, all right, that's it. Get you and you and your whatever he is. Get out of this, uh, get out of my bar. And the man says, wait, give me another chance. Turns the dog again, turns the dog around towards him and says, what's it like being a dog? being pushed around by every slob behind a bar who thinks he's better than you just because he wears pants. And the dog says, ruff, ruff. <laughs> and the bartender says, all right, look, that's enough of you two clowns. And he begins to come around the bar in a very kind of menacing way. And the man says, look, just give me one more chance. I'll show you. Turns again to the dog, turns the dog towards him, and he says, what baseball player holds the record for most home runs batted in a single season? Dog says, Ruth, Ruth. And the barge says, all right, that's it. He picks up the dog by his collar, picks up the man by his collar, takes him to the doors of the saloon, throws him outside. The man trips on the edge of the curb, falls over into the gutter, and the dog rolls after him. They're lying there in the street, and the man says to the dog, well, that was quite a performance. And the dog says, was it Hank Aaron? <laughs> Let's see, we, uh, we could have more questions, but I think I'll end on that uh, cheerful note. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your time.